prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here, The Tom Woods Show. Hey everybody, welcome back to The Tom Woods Show. It is episode 2413, I think, and I am here with an old friend. It is Pastor Brent McGuire. He has been senior pastor of Our Redeemer Lutheran Church since 2008, even though if you look at him, he looks like he's about 15. So I don't know. I can't figure out the math, but I got to know Brent because he was a year behind me at Harvard. Sorry you had to to, to repeat, repeat a year, Brent. That was a shame. But but all the same, <laughs> at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, he earned a Master's of Divinity and a Master's of Sacred Theology. And, and I want to talk to him about a subject I've been promising to folks for a while. And you know, I reached out to a friend of mine, I think I told you, another Lutheran pastor, who said, you know, I could do it, but I think I know somebody else who might be able to do it. And as he was looking for that person, I remembered, wait a minute, what about old Brent McGuire, who I know has actually written on this very topic, but quite some time ago. So Brent, anyway, welcome back. Welcome to the show. It's great to be here. Now, let me begin. I have to, I know everybody wants to hear what we have to say on this subject, but you're going to have to endure one college story. And then at the end, I'm going to share another college story. But the first one is Brent, who didn't actually, he was a year younger than I was. That's why he was a year behind me. But Brent actually delivered the Latin oration at the Harvard commencement exercises when he was graduating. And that is a tradition. uh, And it's a long story how it is that you come to do that. But Brent had to write this thing up and submit it. And it was was, uh, decided that he would deliver the Latin oration. Now, all the students are given an English translation. So they know the moments when they should laugh. And so it looks like all the Harvard students are fluent in Latin because none of the parents or dignitaries are given this copy. So it preserves the illusion that we all have this classical education. So anyway, Brent, being kind of like me in in his opinions, was not, let's say, the world's most popular member of his graduating class. And as a matter of fact, there was a small group of people who were horrified to learn that Brent was going to deliver the Latin oration, they were planning to stand up and turn their backs on him during it. But when they saw it, it was so brilliant and wonderful that they couldn't bring themselves to do it. He had charmed them into acting like civilized people during the commencement. That's my story, Brent. That's very flattering. I think the mimosas that morning had a lot to do with it, too. <laughs> they also have had a little, a little something to do with it. Okay, so before we get started, Obviously, we're talking about a subject that has contemporary relevance, to put it mildly. Some questions of theology might seem remote to people in their daily lives, but this one is not. And I I did say, I I made a remark on Twitter, which is not a place where you, you go to for nuance, in which I spoke of evangelicals. And I had people saying, now, hold on one cotton pick a minute. Not all evangelicals are dispensationalists. Okay, fair enough. But if you had to define the term evangelical in the sense in which people understand it, let's say, in American politics, what what does that word mean? Just start there. Well, I I think uh, evangelicalism in America shares in common. And again, there are exceptions, but your your, your really, really big churches, uh, you know, John Hagee's in San Antonio or... um, uh, uh, will uh, I'm, I'm at a loss to I, I try not to think of them too much. <laughs> but, no, I uh, understand. But your non-denominational Protestant churches uh, in in America tend to share more or less a Baptist theology, which is to say uh, a belief in the Bible as God's inspired word, uh, uh, Jesus Christ, of course, as as the world savior of. Uh, who who has who has come to atone for the sins of the world and and uh, when we place our trust in him uh, we're saved by uh, some kind of Romans road to salvation or or praying the sinner's prayer and and deciding to follow him something like that it's a, a strange mix of of Arminianism and Calvinism uh, if 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 those terms mean anything to to, to your audience but uh, but they also share relevant to to this discussion. Uh, a common understanding of the end times. And, and so, again, not all, but I would say the vast majority of your large non-denominational evangelical uh, churches in America 
subscribe to uh, a view of the end times that involves a rapture and a period of tribulation and uh, a, a lot of things having to do with the, the with Israel and the state of Israel and uh, and and so forth before finally uh, Christ's return and 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 the new heavens and the new earth. So um, I, I I don't know if if that it helps. Yeah, I know. I think I think that's good. Can you explain what the significance of the so-called Schofield Bible is in all this? Oh, sure, sure. So going back about 200 years, you, you had uh, a group of uh, dissenting Anglicans known as the Plymouth Brethren. And the big name there is a, a guy named John Nelson Darby. And he was very much a proponent of this so-called uh, dispensational premillennialism. And, and I'm happy to unpack those big words uh, a little bit, but Needless to say, a, a, a just a, a very specific and and strange, very complicated, actually, understanding of the 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 future and, and the way the the end of the world is going to play out, um, that became popularized down the road by a guy named Cyrus Schofield, who spent some of his uh, years here in Dallas, actually. But Schofield was a a, a big advocate of this understanding of the end times that entailed these so-called dispensations, different eras or ages in which God dealt with people in slightly different ways, beginning with Adam and Eve in a so-called age of innocence, uh, but uh, up till the present time, the so-called sixth age, this age of the church or the age of grace until the the, the final age the, and the consummation. But 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 Schofield divides all of history in, into these different eras and then uh, understands certain uh, things said in the Bible as, as uh, fulfilling these various ages. And what was kind of a, a coup and all a, a, a bit of a fluke, but he befriended the man that was the publisher for Oxford University Press, who took Schofield's Bible study notes and made them the notes, the cross-references, and the footnotes for the publication of the King James Bible that Oxford came out with at the time, this in the, uh, the, the early 1900s now. And so that version of the Bible in English-speaking countries w was you know, a massive bestseller and became the Bible for so many Christians and uh, here's your, uh, how do I understand this, this obscure verse in Daniel? Oh, well, here Schofield is explaining it to me as a, as, as a prediction of the return of the state of Israel and the rebuilding of the temple, et cetera. And, and so, yeah, Schofield was uh, a pioneer and one of the, the trailblazers for the popularity, certainly, of this uh, dispensational premillennial view. Well, since you invited me to ask you this question, I, I will, at least with Pre-millennial. Can you explain what pre- and post-millennialism mean, and how would you say um, a Lutheran uh, looks at that question? Is a Lutheran pre or post or a millennial? Sure. So uh, that that m millennial business comes from one verse in the Book of Revelation, Revelation chapter twenty, that that speaks of a of a thousand year, a thousand year period, and so how these different millennial groups divide up is where they understand Christ's coming again in relation to that thousand year period. And so premillennialists understand Christ is coming again before that thousand year uh, begins. Postmillennialists understand him as coming after that thousand years. And we Lutherans, along with most of Christendom today, and certainly most of Christendom in history, subscribe to an amillennial view, which is to say we don't take that thousand years, first of all, literally. It belongs to Revelation. Almost all of Revelation is apocalyptic and figurative language. And, and so that is especially the case with the numbers in Revelation. But we also understand that thousand years to refer to the period that really began with Christ's ascension and will last until his second coming. So we would understand the thousand years to be the period that we're in even now, 
And instead of dividing history into seven dispensations or seven ages, we with the, the author of Hebrews say, look, there's really two ages, the former times and these latter times. The former times being the time from Adam to Christ, and these, the latter days, the latter times being the time since then. Uh, so it's, <laughs> it certainly makes for a much simpler understanding of, of how all this is going to be brought to an end ultimately. But it, it also, I, I would argue, and we'd be happy to take you through the, the, the controverted text, is, is, is the understanding that makes the most sense out of Scripture out of the biblical data. Well, l- let me take a minute to, to ask you about one particular, a, a, a big, big portion of this issue, which is, I think the term is, has sometimes been used, the great parenthesis, that yeah. in this understanding, the, the church was not actually anticipated by the prophets. They, they could right. not have seen that there would be a church because the primary drama is between God and the Jewish people. And so, yeah. and God did not anticipate the, the Jews rejecting Christ. And so we get the church, which is the great parenthesis. Uh, yeah. But the real story is God's drama with the Jews, which resumes in 1948 with the creation of, this, of the state of Israel. A- am, I, am I saying that in a way, am I caricaturing the position when I say that? N- no, they themselves use that word parenthesis to describe the age we're in now, that when Christ came, he came to restore Israel to its earthly glory. And when the Israelites rejected him, uh, that set in motion a kind of plan B uh, in which the, the gospel went out to the Gentiles and now we're, we, we have, have a church. Uh, and th- this is, this, this is uh, um, o- only to last until Israel gets its act together again. And, and then, you know, all these Old Testament promises, which are read literally and not seen as being ultimately fulfilled in Christ and in the church, um, but, but rather as, as, as promises that remain unfulfilled until Israel literally gets its land back and Israel literally has its monarchy restored, et cetera. Um, and, and so, yeah, yeah. It, it treats the cross even, when you think about it, as sort of the backup plan. Uh, at, hey, I grew well, up think- with, the, with the Schofield Bible, um, but I also, when I was older, uh, used a Bible by another premillennial dispensationalist edited by a man by the name of Dr. Charles Ryrie. And uh, Ryrie in his notes will say that that kind of the goal of biblical uh, history is to uh, reveal the, the glory of God as seen in his salvation and other things. <laughs> so uh, it's not just that Christ redeemed the world by his atoning death and resurrection, but he's glorified also in restoring Israel uh, to, to its uh, pride of place in an earthly sense. So I think that gives it away that if it's a caricature, it's a caricature, it's, it's only slightly because there's Ryrie admitting, yes, the, the glory is to be found in, in, in the salvation story, but apparently not only in that, also in what God plans to work out in terms of Israel's uh, political futures. Hey, everybody, quick message on behalf of our sponsor, Delete Me. I know many of you understand the need for data privacy online, but recently it's become more urgent than ever. Yes, we want to avoid identity theft and we have other concerns too, but the potential for doxing and harassment and worse has suddenly become much more dire. For instance, we've seen jurors connected to Trump cases having personal information about their families spread. The conflict between Israel and Hamas has likewise resulted in targeting of people on both sides. And here's the kicker. People on the other side of an argument from you can generally find your private personal details. 98% of U.S. citizens can have private details uncovered by data brokers. Delete Me research shows the volume of personal data on individuals available online has tripled between 2019 and 2023, 
to an average of over 525 pieces of personal info per person, available free or for as little as $5 per profile. Do you want that trove of personal data being weaponized and shared? That could take the form not just of harassment, but also spoofing or reputational attacks, targeting of your family members, targeting of your employer, you name it. Well, Delete Me comes to the rescue. Data that you don't want out there, it'll get removed. The process is super simple. I know because I've done it myself. I submitted my personal information that I wanted removed from search engines and data broker sites. Delete Me's experts find and remove it, and within seven days, I received a detailed report from Delete Me. Simple and effective. Now, because you know old Woods here, you can get 20% off all consumer plans by going to joindeleteme.com slash woods and using coupon code WOODS at checkout. That's joindeleteme.com slash woods and code WOODS at checkout. Well, can you then walk us through exactly how they expect the end times to go, including the so-called rapture? Yeah, okay. <clears throat> so I, I don't, don't want to bore your listeners uh, and get no, too I, into They want to hear this because we yeah. the world needs to know what's going on with all this. So it, it's, it's really this horrible copy and paste job that they do with a, a verse here or a verse there. And they say, ah, see, uh, this place in Daniel that refers to uh, a 70th week uh, in which a, a covenant will be made uh, regarding the temple, that's yet to be fulfilled. And of course, we've got to understand the, the 70th week as as, as as seven days, but days understood as representing seven years. And so where else do we have seven years somewhere in the Bible, that kind of thing. And so uh, by by kind of skipping to Ezekiel and then skipping over to Revelation, they, they put together this scheme where the, the, the expectation is that at some point in the future, someone is going to come along and allow not only Israel to be a nation state again, which we have had since 1948, and obviously that was a, a huge I told you so from, from these premillennial dispensationalists and, and you know, only increased the, the enthusiasm for, for, for this particular way of seeing things. But that someone's going to come along is actually going to make possible the rebuilding of the temple and we've got to have the rebuilding of the temple because this verse in Daniel, which they interpret as, 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 as meaning uh, some, some future uh, covenant, uh, has, to, has to happen uh, as, as a last domino to fall. But that then in the middle of this period, there's going to be this period of terrible tribulation. And again, not because it says so in Daniel, but because in verses in Revelation, that they assume vaguely <laughs> are, are incorporating the verse from Daniel speaks of a tribulation. Uh, and, and so we've got this, this seven years of tribulation, uh, the first three and a half, which we have temple sacrifices going on again in the temple. And then we have three and a half years of that ending and, and terrible things happening uh, to Israel especially, but, but to the world. And then finally, uh, the, the inauguration of this, this, this thousand year reign on earth by Jesus. Now, all that I said um, w w was in place 200 years ago or so, that, that, that view of things. But an added piece came in the early 19th century going back to that Darby fellow and the Plymouth Brethren, and they were having this kind of revival meeting when this young girl, I'm not quite sure what her age was supposed to be, 11, 12, 13, her name was Margaret McDonald. She receives this vision, this dream, in which God tells her that before that period of tribulation starts, the church, believers in Christ, are going to be raptured. They're going to be uh, rescued in this kind of secret resurrection. Uh, those living at the time will be beamed up to heaven and spared the horrible things that are going to go on during that seven-year tribulation period. And so there's the beginning of your rapture idea. 
I mean, it, it would have been unrecognizable to a Christian living in the first 1800 years of, of, of the, the Christian church's history. That's how relatively recent an idea this is and what a, a, a distortion of, of the biblical passages it ends up being because the Plymouth Brethren and, and premillennial dispensationalists afterwards say, aha, here's where the, the Bible has told us this all along and we just didn't see it. Uh, you, you have this passage in, in 1 Thessalonians where, where Paul is addressing Christians there who are concerned about their, their loved ones who have already died. They've died believing, but Christ hasn't come yet. What does this mean for them? And Paul says, ah, here's, here, here's what you have to understand. When Jesus does come, first, those who have already died in Christ will rise first. They will, they will rise to meet him. Their, their earthly bodies will be resurrected and they will rise to meet the Lord. And then we who are alive at that time will also go to meet him in the air and all together we will be with the Lord. Now, here's the problem. There, there's a, a verb in Greek. It gets translated in Latin as rapiemor. Uh, we will be caught up, right? There's your rapture word, right? Um, but we'll be caught up in the air to meet the Lord. And that meeting word, apontesis in the Greek, that meeting word you find in, in two other places in the New Testament and outside of the New Testament, it's used in this technical way to refer to the, the meeting of an embassy uh, or an embassy meeting a dignitary who are, uh, comes to visit a town or a city. And so what happens? The, the dignitary, let's say the king or the prince or the ambassador representing the king is just outside the city gates. And now ambassadors from the city, they, they come out and, and escort him in. Uh, this, this is described in a very um, down-to-earth way in, in one of Paul's visits to a city at the end of the book of Acts, where they come out, and again, that apontesis word is used of these, these fellows from the city, and they meet Paul, and then they accompany him as he comes, comes into the town. And then it's also used in the parable of the, the wise and foolish virgins, where the, the, the wise virgins meet the bridegroom as, as he approaches the wedding hall. Now, now, here's the thing. In all three circumstances, think about it. When the meeting occurs with the dignitary, with Paul, with, with the bridegroom in the parable, with Jesus in the air in 1 Thessalonians, what, what do you expect to happen after the meeting? There's not a reversal of direction. The bridegroom continues in the same direction to enter the wedding hall. Paul keeps going in the same direction he was going and enters the city. And so likewise, why would we expect anything other than once Jesus has been met by believers, both dead now raised and those living at the time, to continue to descend, corresponding to the, uh, the, the, the heavenly Jerusalem coming down, uh, new heavens and new earth. In other words, 1 Thessalonians does not describe some secret rapture event, but the one and only second coming. This, this is the end of the world. It's not some... Um, second coming before the second second coming or the third coming or whatever. It's the one and only second coming. And uh, so, so there's that. And then, uh, of course, they, they read back into Jesus' famous end times discourse. You find it in Matthew, Mark, and, and Luke. But, uh, but, but especially in Matthew and Luke's version, where, where Jesus says, I don't, you know, no one knows uh, concerning that day, the day or the hour, not even the Son of Man. Uh, so, so that right there should tell you to treat with a great grain of salt, uh, in any premillennial dispensationalist telling you, aha, well, we at least have an idea of the season in which this is going to happen, right? Uh, if we don't know the exact time that that's, that's their, their way out of that. But, but in that context, Jesus emphasizing the suddenness of the event that, that he could come at any time. And therefore, to watch and, and to be vigilant and to be ready and to be found in the, in the faith when he does return. He uses examples. So, for example, uh, as in the days of Noah, uh, where people are marrying and being given into marriage, and then all of a sudden the flood comes. Or 
he, he uses the example of a householder, and that the householder knew when uh, a, a burglar would, would break in, it, he, he would have taken greater steps to, to protect his goods. And uh, it's in that same context that Jesus talks about how in the day of his return, there will be two in the field, and one will be taken, and one will be left behind. That kind of thing. Uh, two, 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 two will be uh, will, will be working, and, and and one's taken, one's left behind. Now you know from the, the highly popular, amazingly best-selling series of novels, Left Behind, that that they understand the person that's left behind as the person that is found unbelieving when Jesus returns, and therefore is 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 left out, does not benefit. From, from that rapture event, and that, that the, the one raptured is the one taken. Well, I argue, and lo and behold, I'm not the only one to see this. Uh, the great Anglican biblical scholar N.T. Wright has, has said the same thing, that while Jesus doesn't say which is which, you know, the, the whole point is the suddenness of the event. But it's fairly clear from the surrounding examples Noah and the flood, the guy who gets burgled, that to be taken is the bad thing. To be left is the good thing. In other words, who is left after the flood? Noah and his family. To be taken is, 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 is the event to be avoided. Likewise with the, the, the house owner, to have your goods taken is the bad thing. That's judgment. To have your goods left uh, is 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 the positive, and so it's as if the left behind guys they have it exactly backwards. To be left behind is the good thing. Moreover, the verbs in the Greek uh, to be left behind that verb for left is in one of the two versions of the Lord's Prayer. The word for forgive, and the word for taken is elsewhere in the Gospels. The very word used to describe what happened to Jesus when he was arrested. So again, to be taken is bad. To be left is good. And, and yet we, we have millions of evangelicals in this world uh, who believe, who are fearful of being left behind on the, the day of the so-called rapture. Anyway, that's probably too much. No, 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 no. It's perfectly good. I, I, I was thinking as I was uh, doing a little reading for today about what seems to me to be the insuperable obstacle here that nobody had ever heard of any of this until about yeah. 200 years ago. Right. Whereas in the early church, there was, people were very, very alert to novelties being introduced. If it's a novelty, then it's, it it's not, doesn't come from, um, from God because we've, we've already been told what we need to know, so we don't need any novelties. But this is an extraordinary novelty. Yes. And it, again, if you think of all the major fig, I mean, figures of, of Christendom, you know, who's, intellectual contributions are significant. You know, going from Augustine all the way through Thomas Aquinas and indeed from the reformers, from Luther, Calvin, and on, on down the road. Right. None of them would have been aware of this. So I thought they can't possibly have a reply to that. But the reply is that, well, you know, God reveals things in his own time. But it just seems astonishing that his own time is 1,800 years. Right. And, and that, Right. The manner of, of it is a series of notes in a, you know, in cross references in a text. And it se just seems odd. But then the other thing is, they will also say, they don't just sit back and take it when people like you and me have things to say to them. What they say is, somebody like Brent McGuire believes in so called replacement theology mm -hmm. and that this is bad, that you're saying that the Jews in the grand drama of salvation have been replaced by the church, whereas they would say, my copy of the Old Testament certainly looks like God is saying, I'm giving you this particular land. I'm not spiritualizing it. I, I'm not anticipating that sometime in the future it'll have some other meaning. He's saying, this is for you. Yeah. And you replacement uh, theologians, uh, most of you are probably anti-Semites. You think I'm joking about that? That is what a lot of them say. Yeah. That you're anti-Semites, you hate the Jews, that's why you want to uh, quote unquote, replace them with the church. How do you answer that? Well, the the, the problem is the New Testament, 
uh, and, and, and you have Christ himself and, and, and St. Paul and others telling us that, the, that, that Israel was, was all along um, a prefigurement of, of, of a much larger fulfillment um, that, that, that finds its fulfillment ultimately in all believers, uh, not just Jewish ones, but, but Jew and Gentile both make up the, the Israel of God, as Paul refers to it in, in, in Galatians, that, that the children of Abraham are not children of Abraham by descent or by bloodline, but by, by faith, uh, that, that we're children of the promise as Abraham uh, believed in the promise and it was credited to him as righteousness. Um, that, that the dispensationalists are, are guilty of the very problem Paul is taking the Galatian Christians to task for, which is to have been brought to faith in Christ, but then fall back on uh, a, a way of reading the Old Testament that treats it as a closed book, as though Christ doesn't change things. And so it's not that, that we replace the Jews with Gentile believers, but now the church includes both. I mean, how many times does Paul talk about first to the Gentiles that, that, that uh, uh, don't, don't, don't get haughty uh, because all of a sudden you seem to be in greater numbers coming to, to salvation than, than Jews, because remember, you're being grafted on to the tree that is naturally theirs. Um, in, in Romans, you have that analogy of the, the, the olive tree and the, the natural branches are the Jews who had this promise from the beginning. And Gentiles only now are being grafted in. And that will always be the case, that there is kind of an order of salvation to the Jew first and, and, and also to the Greek or also to the Gentile. Um, so we're not saying there's, there's, the Jews are still those for whom Christ died, but so are the Gentiles. And so the church is to be made up of, of both groups. But this idea that salvation for them is, is limited to this, this, this patch of land that's no bigger than New Jersey. I mean, over and again in the New Testament, you see these promises in the old broadened, made cosmic in scope. It's not just the meek shall inherit the land or the meek shall inherit Palestine, the meek shall inherit the earth. Uh, and, and it's striking. I, I granted it's an argument from silence, but if, if this is so important, the restoration of the land to Israel, the restoration of the monarchy, the rebuilding of the temple, why do none of the apostolic writers talk about that? I mean, the, the whole argument of the book of Hebrews is that you Jewish Christians who are tempted in the face of uh, the, the ostracism of your family, uh, being kicked out of the synagogue to, to go back to the old ways. And, and the whole rest of Hebrews is to say that the temple ain't it anymore. Christ is the temple. His body is the temple. He himself said so. And so, um, I mean, for, for all those reasons, it, 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 it strikes me as uh, a very unchristian view of things to sort of set up this kind of second track that there, there's a, that there's for the Jews, some other way than by faith in Christ to become part of the true spiritual Israel. Hey everybody, quick message on behalf of our sponsor, Crowd Health. Now let's be honest. If you could make a prison break out of the American health insurance system, wouldn't you? Well, of course, why wouldn't you? Everybody deals with increasing premiums and deductibles getting ever higher, and more and more claims denials. It's a headache and a mess, and everybody hates it. But people endure it because they think there's no alternative. But there is an alternative. Crowd health is the alternative. It's not health insurance. It's a better way to pay for health care through crowdfunding. You can break free from the antiquated insurance system without breaking the bank and get into a health care option that fits your needs. Let me tell you about Anthony in New Jersey who wrote me an unsolicited note. He said, I heard about Crowd Health on your show a while back and signed up with your link. My wife and I are in our early 30s and expecting our first child in October. To date, they have been great to work with and wanted to pass along a good review for them. I was curious to see how this would all work out during pregnancy, but they have been great, highly recommended. And it's very, very simple. 
You get a $50 a month membership, and that gives you the tools and services you need to get the highest quality healthcare. So we're talking about telemedicine visits, discounted prescriptions. You don't have to deal with doctor's networks. You have a private personal care advocate who helps you navigate the complexities of health events and even negotiates bills on your behalf. And you'll be part of the crowd, which is a group of members just like you who want to help each other pay for each other's unexpected medical events. Well, it's time you opt out of restrictive health insurance plans and let Crowd Health help fit your health care needs. Get started today for just $50 per month. Go to joincrowdhealth.com slash woods to get the health care you deserve. Crowd Health is not insurance. Learn more at joincrowdhealth.com slash woods. That's joincrowdhealth.com slash woods. What then would somebody in, as you say, most of Christendom have said about the role of the Jews in the end times? Is there one? If so, what is it? Well, we know that between now and our Lord's second coming, one of the reasons that coming is delayed, as far as our perspective is concerned, is that there's someone else out there God wants to bring into his kingdom. And when Paul talks about the, this, he, he refers to it as a mystery that in the Jews of his day, by and large, rejecting the offer of salvation that came by way of Christ, the gospel then spread to the Gentiles as a kind of way to incite their jealousy, that, that the Jews seeing the Gentiles come to faith in their Messiah would, by that circumstance, be led to investigate the promises of the gospel and, and some in that way be brought to faith so that, that in this way, as he says in Romans 11, uh, all Israel might be saved. And so when he says all Israel, it, it only makes sense given the, the context in which he's already said now, not all Israel are Israel. That is to say, not all who are descendants of Abraham actually belong to what counts as spiritual Israel in God's eyes. That when he says all Israel there at the end of his discussion, it, he means the, the whole church, Jew and Gentile, all believers in Christ. And so that obviously includes the Jews, that, that there, there are among the Jewish people many that God still wants to see saved, uh, brought to, to, to a knowledge of their, their sin and, and the forgiveness of sins won for them in Christ and uh, to, to be incorporated into the church. And, but, but, but now this, this church that has been broadened to include those who were not part of Israel before Christ came. Well, can I put you on the spot then with the yeah. toughest question? I haven't really asked tough ones. This is a tough one. Um, would you say, therefore, that a Christian could have his own secular reasons for supporting the state of Israel versus its enemies, but is not under any theological obligation to side with it in all circumstances or assume that it is always righteously upholding the side of God in whatever contest it finds itself in? Th that's exactly right. And, and when I teach these things in, in my Bible classes or, or preach on them, that's, that's, I'm in very much an evangelical area of the country. We are surrounded by uh, mega denominational churches and, and uh, Bible churches that, that teach this very understanding of the modern state of Israel. And so I, I want to free the members of my parish of the burden of thinking that, that somehow God mandates a, a kind of uncritical stance towards the modern state of Israel. Um, the, the verses in Genesis 12, for example, come into play a lot uh, in, in, I think, everyday conversations. Well, God says there in Genesis 12, I will bless those who bless you uh, and, 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 and your descendants, speaking to Abraham, and I will curse those who, who curse you. See there? But, but again, we know that now that Christ has come, to be a true descendant of, of Abraham is, is to, to share Abraham's faith. And so that promise 
doesn't apply to the modern state of Israel, which has no theological significance. None. But that promise applies to his church, that, that, that those who bless the church will be blessed and those who curse the church will be cursed. Um, a- anyway, um, th- that, that is so important because people are led, at least in their, their decisions on, on, on whom to vote or what policies to support and so forth, they're led to believe that it's unchristian to criticize anything that the, the, the state of Israel does. And that even in, in, entails sometimes, it seems to me, support of, of, of measures that go way beyond what a, a Christian would find in keeping with just war theory and, and so forth. Um, and we dehumanize the, the political enemies of Israel uh, this way. And, and no, there, there's, there's nothing, that, there, there's never been a time in the church's history when it would have been wrong for Christians to think that the Lord's return could be imminent. And that includes the present day. There's, there's no other domino to fall regarding the, 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 the political fortunes of, of Israelites that, that we have to wait for before we can really think, oh, well, now Jesus might come back. No. Jesus says no one knows concerning you know, the day or the hour and, and, and he speaks of the suddenness of his return. And, and there's been nothing since his ascension that, that, that Christians have to look for before they can take seriously the possibility of the parousia or, or his, his second coming. Um, so yes, Christians ought to feel, apply their sanctified reason and, and, and apply how they think about the modern state of Israel the way they would another in any other country, in any other country. Um, uh, ally or, or neighbor of, of, of the United States, but, but not to think, oh, because they are the chosen people, they are the, the Israelites, that, that, that somehow uh, different standards apply. Again, it's a secular state that has nothing to do with, with the Israel of the Bible, uh, and, and certainly not, not since Christ has come to make all of us who believe in him the, the true spiritual Israel. Well, I'm not going to let you go just yet, but I want to thank you very much for coming on and clarifying what, as you say, are surprisingly complicated things. So we had a rather simple way of thinking of all this, and then, then this came along. But before I let you go, I want to keep my promise and tell one more college story. Now, I'm, oh I'm going to make myself a little vulnerable here and say, um, I still think of you as my best friend from college. Oh. And we... You kind of fell away for a while. And so it's great to have a chance to talk to you again. But I remember there was a year when our parents had each gotten us the William F. Buckley Word a Day calendar. Remember that? (laughs) Yeah. yeah. And and the thing is, a regular Word a Day calendar, okay, it's going to have the odd word you you haven't heard before, but you'll know a lot of them. The Buckley calendar were words that (laughs) no one would ever use. Right. And so we had this rule that we, we didn't stick with it very long. You remember that the first time we would see each other during the day, yeah. we had to try to use that word in our first sentence to the other. And right, one I day I know the, the word one was... Gonna, well, we'll see. We'll see. I, I think I know the one you're going to bring up. You did, okay, okay. The word was hemi demi semi quaver. Oh, okay. No, that wasn't the one. All right. Oh, oh, subspecia eternitatis? No. It wasn't that. <laughs> but it, it, how it do you luxurious. use these in your first sentence? Wait, it what was, was luxurious. It? And when one of our friends had, uh, he had to get super glue. For some for some reason to fix something that had broken in his in his uh, in his dorm room and uh, and he was complaining about how expensive it was <laughs> right and I said oh usurious glue you mean <laughs> <laughs> perfect perfect I but forgot what, what, about what that one were, what about uh, hemi demi semi quaver yeah but how do you use that in a sentence especially in your greeting when you're greeting somebody <laughs> there's no way to fit that in. Anyway, all right, listen, you and I have to exchange old stories at some point, but probably yeah. not here on the podcast. That's so, right. We, we lost our listeners a long time ago. Long time ago. Yeah. But, but anyway, thanks so much. Um, this was exactly what we needed, and um, I'll, I'll be in touch with you soon, but thank you. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, you even know the closing line. Thank you, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.
Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.